Hello, and welcome to the Sales Acceleration Summit. My name is Mick Allison. I'm the CMO of InsideSales.com, the presenting sponsor of this event. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Matt Dixon. Matt is the Executive Director of the Sales and Service Practice of the Corporate Executive Board in Arlington, Virginia. He has management responsibility for the Sales Leadership Council and Customer Contact Leadership Council, which together serve more than 1,000 sales and customer service organizations globally. In addition to his many speaking engagements, Matt is a prolific business writer. His most recent book is the Wall Street Journal and Amazon bestseller, The Challenger Sale, Taking Control of the Customer Conversation. He's been published twice in Harvard Business Review with his article, The End of Solution Sales, in the summer of 2012 issue, and Stop Trying to Delight Your Customers in the summer 2010 issue. His new book on customer service, The Effortless Experience, Conquering the New Battleground for Customer Loyalty, is available on Amazon now. Matt holds a Ph.D. from the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh. It's my pleasure to introduce to all of you Matt Dixon. This is Matt Dixon. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here with you today uh, talking to you about uh, some of the research that we've done uh, around the Challenger sale. Um, I'd like to start today's uh, session by talking about what we think is the biggest shift happening in the world of B2B sales today, uh, and that is uh, the phenomenon of customers out there learning on their own. Um, today, uh, what we find is in the, the average B2B sale, we go out to customers and study this, and this is data from several thousand customers, B2B customers, um, that we find that customers are engaging the salesperson later and later in the purchase process. What you see here um, is in the, what the data tells us is that customers engage the average salesperson uh, roughly 60% of the way through the purchase journey. And what does that mean for the salesperson? Well, what that means is that the customers already figure, are already asked themselves, you know, what's keeping us up at night? They've already diagnosed their own needs. They've already thought about the different ways to address those business challenges, to address those needs. They've thought about the suppliers who could address those needs. They've shortlisted those suppliers against one another, and then they pick up the phone to talk to the salesperson. And it's a real bummer as a salesperson because all that stuff you were taught in sales training to do, to ask great questions and diagnose needs and uh, talk about your value proposition and your solution relative to the competition – well, the customers kind of learned all that stuff on their own, and they've learned it by going to our website because we put all that information on there. They've learned it by talking to peers and engaging on fora like LinkedIn to actually um, get uh, vendor evaluations. They use third-party purchasing consultants now to help them get smart on different suppliers who are out there. And their own procurement organizations are much savvier and much more sophisticated with data and tools that they didn't have just a few years ago. So. Really what this enables the customer to do is to push the salesperson out as far out as humanly possible in that purchase journey. It's, it's actually not unlike how we buy cars today. You think about years ago, you go into the car dealership and the salesperson would walk the lot with you and show you the different features and benefits of the car. Today you show up very clearly articulating, here is the car I want. I know exactly what options package, what color, etc. You know what the dealer paid for that car. Uh, and you even know what other people in your town or your city or zip code paid for the same vehicle. Did they get 1% below invoice or 2% below invoice, for example? You know, and you, in fact, get a little bit frustrated when the salesperson tries to sell you anything because all you really want them to do is fulfill the order you've already got in your head. And so this, remember, that's a, that's a B2C example, admittedly, but this is B2B data. This is for people buying complex stuff, you know, supply chain solutions, CRM systems, uh, cloud computing software, um, uh, uh, audit services, you name it. This is complex stuff, and these are sophisticated business purchases, and it still tells us that left to their own devices, customers will push you out um, as late as they can, can in the purchase journey. And what we've come to tell customers today, our customers, our members um, at CEB, is that your biggest comp uh, competition today, in fact, isn't really the competitor you'd probably think of off the top of your head. Your biggest competitor today is the customer's ability to learn on their own. Um, in a world where customers are learning on their own, in the world where they're boxing salespeople out, though, let's ask the opposite question. What are they looking for? And this is where we go from some bad news, admittedly, to what we think is some very good news for salespeople. When we went out and studied what drives customer loyalty, um, well, we found something uh, pretty fascinating. We went out to customers, those same customers who gave us the data on the previous slide, now about 5,000 business customers, and we asked them to evaluate a supplier that they recently bought a uh, solution from. 
Uh, and then we asked them to compare that supplier to the supplier who came in second. And as we all know, that's the worst place to finish in sales is second place. All that blood, sweat, and tears, and not, you leave with nothing. Um, so we asked them to compare the supplier they chose with the supplier who came in second, uh, the runner-up in the bake-off. And we asked them to compare those suppliers across a whole range of dimensions. You th see things at the bottom here like the, the brand and company reputation uh, of those different suppliers, um, the quality of their products and customer service, uh, their value to price ratio, and lots of questions around uh, the sales experience, what it was like to actually engage commercially with those different suppliers. Um, at the end of that survey, we asked how loyal they, uh, were you to the supplier that you chose. We didn't ask it that way. We actually asked it in a very sales-specific way. So we asked three things. One, how likely are you to keep buying from the supplier over time? So when the contract uh, comes due, would you be likely to renew it? Two, how likely would you be to open your wallet to spend more with the supplier over time? If they came out with a, a new version of the solution, an enhanced version, would you be open to spending more with that supplier? And number three, would you say good things about the supplier if somebody asked, whether that's inside your company or outside? And we regress all the data. We end up with the slide you see here um, uh, right, right in front of you, this waterfall bar chart. It's the single slide we've put out uh, across all of this research. It's ended up in more boardroom-level presentations than anything we've ever put out. And the reason is this that it answers a very basic question, which is what do customers want from the suppliers they do business with, but it answers in a very surprising way. And when you do the math, what you find is that more than half of what drives business customer loyalty is actually a function not of what you sell, but actually of how you sell it. The sales experience constitutes 53% of what, of what drives customer loyalty, which is a huge eye-opener for people. And when you dig into that a bit, what you find is it's a specific kind of sales experience that customers are looking for. They're looking for a sales experience, as you see on the right-hand side, where the salesperson comes in and offers a unique or valuable perspective on the market where they help the customer navigate through different alternative ways of solving business problems or getting after different challenges, where they help the customer think, around, think about uh, landmines to avoid in the future or help them look around corners, where they educate the customer on new issues and outcomes. In other words, what drives this level of customer loyalty is an insight-based sales conversation where the sales person shows up, put very simply, with new ideas to make money, to save money, to avoid risk, to steal market share, to engage employees, whatever the outcome is that you deliver for your customers, that where the salesperson shows up with that new idea. Now, it doesn't mean the stuff on the left is unimportant. We'd be very careful here. You've got to have a great brand. You've got to have a great reputation. You've got to have a great product. You've got to have great customer service. But really, in the eyes of your customers, those things are table stakes. They're, they're enough to get you to the bake-off if you've got a bad brand, a bad product, and overpriced uh, you know, your, your value to price ratio is out of whack, you don't even get invited to the bake-off. But once you're there, what the data suggests is that's not enough to win you the deal. Uh, what wins you the deal is something else, and what wins you the deal is the kind of sales experience, to use the words of Neil Rackham, the kind of sales experience that delivers insight, the kind of sales experience that a customer would pay for. And that's a pretty powerful thing. Now, um, as we uh, get into this, I think you're, you're probably thinking to yourself, you know, you said this was a good news slide, um, and it, it kind of feels like scary news, actually, because when I look at that sales experience described on the right-hand side, I don't know if my salespeople can deliver that kind of sales experience. In fact, I don't know that we're putting content in their hands to have an insight-based sales conversation. I, I'm pretty sure we're, our people are equipped to kind of show up and throw up. They're equipped to be talking brochures or cor corporate parrots, or maybe we're just asking our people to go in and ask open-ended questions. Um, we're not really asking our people, we're not arming them to go in and deliver insight in the way that customers are telling us they're, they're looking for. Um, let me tell you what the answer is on both of those pieces, because the reality is, and the challenge of research is really about um, the skills required for, of the salesperson to go in and deliver that kind of sales experience, but at the same time, it's about an organization putting content in the hands of the salesperson to have that kind of conversation. But let me just sum up here and, and, and sort of juxtapose this with the last slide. Um, if we find that the biggest competitor today, your biggest competitor, is your customer's ability to learn on their own, what the data on this slide tell us is that what customers really want is the thing that they missed. In a world where they can learn on their own, what they want from a salesperson, what they want from a business supplier is to be shown the thing that they missed. That is the new currency of customer loyalty in a world where customers are empowered with information. So what kind of salesperson do you need to sell in this world? Well, herein uh, is the, the crux and really um, uh, the heart of a lot of the challenger research um, the research that we did um, was uh, research done with sales managers. We asked sales managers to evaluate um, 
uh, the, the different sellers on their team, uh, one against another across a range of dimensions you see on this slide. And I won't walk through all of these in the interest of time, but you see we cast a pretty broad net. Now, the, the one thing you want to think about when you look at some of these sample variables that we tested, this isn't the complete list, just a sample list, but when you look at it, what we tried to focus on was, uh, on was things that were more nurture than nature. So we're trying to steer clear of personality type stuff and look at the things that with the right training, with the right coaching, with the right uh, support from the organization, the average seller could actually get better at. That's what we're focused on. And what we find is when you throw, up the, throw all the data up in the air and you do something uh, scientifically we call factor analysis, you find that some of the data washes out as noise. It's not, it's, uh, it may be important, it may, it may be uh, statistically significant, but it doesn't describe difference one seller to the rest. But there are variables that are left over in the model that clump together into five discrete buckets which do describe difference one seller to the next. And you see those over on the next page. We call these the five profiles of salespeople. And I'll walk through each of these in turn. Um, now, uh, as, you go, as I go through this, think about yourself as a seller. Think about your colleagues. Think about your boss. Um, uh, think about, uh, though, that these are, the right way to think about these is as sort of college majors, you know, or university specializations. Um, what, what I mean by that is that these are not mutually exclusive. Uh, sellers have trace elements of all of the profiles. In fact, your best salespeople can probably do all five of these things on call when the situation demands it um, uh, from the customer. But it still remains that uh, in the beginning, as we started doing this research in the book we wrote with about 6,000 reps in the sample, today we've got about 35,000 salespeople globally across every um, uh, ge major ge geographic um, uh, market, uh, every major go-to-market model, every major industry. And I can tell you that after uh, doing this research for several years, every single one of those 35,000 reps can be statistically placed into one of these buckets. They may have trace elements of the other four categories, but they still spike in one. It, defi it defines their primary posture when it comes to selling and engaging with the customer. Um, Let's walk through them one by one. So you've got the hard worker. The hard worker is kind of your nose to the grindstone seller. They are all about volume. Their view is that um, the more leads I get in the, or the more deals I feed into the front of the funnel, uh, as long as I follow the process, um, business will come out the back end. They kind of take a volumetrics approach, an activity approach uh, to selling. Uh, sales managers love these folks because they get in early, they stay late, and they will bang out more calls and knock on more customer doors than anybody else on the team. And they're always eager for feedback. So they're really a pleasure to manage in that respect. Two, you've got the challenger. And the challenger is sort of the debater on the team. They're not afraid to uh, uh, take an idea and kind of use it to push the customer a bit outside their comfort zone perhaps, to make them blink, to make them scratch their head and kind of rethink core elements of their own business and uh, their own assumptions. Uh, unfortunately, they can be tough to manage. They, they're not afraid to use their provocative point of view to push their colleagues uh, outside their comfort zone, to push their manager a bit, to push the president of the business or the CEO of the, the organization outside of his or her comfort zone either. As one head of sales said, you know, it's a bummer to find out that challengers do so well because I fired some of these folks uh, about five years ago because they just didn't fit in our company. So they can be a tough cultural fit sometimes. Uh, relationship builders. I want to be really careful about the relationship builder. Uh, we're not trying to make a straw man argument. You'll see that uh, over on the next page as we get into the differences um, uh, between challengers and relationship builders. These are not the glad-handing sycophants, the five martini lunches, the bring a box of donuts to the office kind of folks, the round of golf kind of folks. They might do that from time to time. A lot of salespeople will. What these people, though, do is what we've told salespeople to do for years. They put themselves on the customer side of the table. They walk a mile in the customer's shoes. They see it as their job to advocate for the customer inside the supplier's organization. So if the customer wants us to customize a solution, even if it eats into our profitability, they see it as their job to get that done for the customer. If the customer wants some special term or condition or pricing even uh, to help them with um, uh, sort of uh, uh, swallow the deal, if you will, the, the relationship builder sees it as their job to lobby for the customer inside their own organization. One head of sales told me, he said, I, I know exactly who you're talking about. These are the folks that when I walk the floor and I listen to the calls going on from my sellers, these are the people who call up all their, sell all their customers in their territory once a month like clockwork and say, hey, you know, it's Bob from Acme Company. Just want to check in and make sure everything's okay. Whatever you need, I got you covered. That's kind of their posture. It's a very service-oriented kind of posture. Next, you've got lone wolves. Now, lone wolves are sort of the prima donnas of the sales organization. They don't, uh, they don't, they're probably the people who are not dialed into today's event. That would be the first clue. The second thing, though, is you know, they don't follow the sales process. They don't file their expenses on time. They build their own marketing collateral. They sell things that you don't even make. Uh, and then they ask, their, they ask for forgiveness instead of permission, right? And the truth is many companies let people get away with this stuff. There are some exceptions. 
uh, where uh, legal risk of uh, noncompliance is very high, so financial services, pharmaceuticals, medical devices. In places like that, you don't find a lot of lone wolves because there's a steep penalty to breaking the rules. But in most other companies, as long as nobody goes to jail and nobody dies, lone wolves who hit their number are actually kind of allowed to get away with it. Um, we kind of do a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, hey, next time try to sell the thing we actually make, but great job hitting your number, um, and we're excited that you're going to the chairman's club this year. Um, so you see when we get to the results, there's a bit of sample bias with lone wolves because the ones who are left are the ones who are actually performing very well. The ones who don't perform, they get, uh, they get sort of uh, weeded out pretty quickly. Uh, problem solvers. Problem solvers are sort of um, a misnomer. The right way to think of this is sort of a reactive problem solver because all salespeople are in the business of solving customer problems, aren't they? But the thing that makes these folks different is the reactive manner in which they do so, that they see it as their posture to focus more on post-deal execution, getting the system or the solution properly implemented rather than getting the next deal through the funnel. So customers love that. Sales managers, not so much. So very intellectually interesting, I think, to think about the different sellers and think about yourself as a seller and where you might fall into this framework. But the real question is, how do these folks do relative to one another? Um, and that's what you're looking at here is the distribution of average performing salespeople. That's the light gray bars. Uh, these are the middle 60% of the distribution of the sales force against the high performers, the dark blue bars. That's the top 20% of sellers in our study. And what you find here is, put very simply, there are five ways to be an average salesperson. There's not a lot of a story there when you look at the average sellers. There's a bit of a spike in the relationship builder, but truthfully, there's good representation in the other four profiles too. But when you look at the top performers, when you look at those star performers, the top 20% of the sellers in our study, here you see very, a very clear story about a predominant way to be a star, and that's to be a challenger. Now, I want to be careful. It's not a silver bullet. Um, there are other ways to be a high-performing salesperson. But if you were a betting person, you'd put your money on a challenger being more likely to be a high performer. And look at the relationship builder. This is even a bigger surprise to most heads of sales, that the relationship builder comes in dead last. And it's this, this uh, dichotomy, if you will, this tension between the relationship builder and the challenger that I think has sparked so much curiosity and interest around this work uh, about the challenger sale. Because really, uh, the conventional wisdom out there in sales is that, look, people sell to people. Selling today in B2B is about relationships, about personal relationships. And what you're telling me here is the people who are best at that actually do worse, what, the worst when it comes to high performance. So it raises lots of questions about the nature of these two kinds of challenger and the relationship builder and what's really different about them and do relationships matter in the world of B2B sales. So let's dig into that a little bit here. Uh, we're on the next page, and here what you see is a full breakout of the variables that cluster together to define the challenger against the relationship builder profile. Now, if you look at the challenger, uh, you see six variables. We put a little bit of a wrapper around it to help it kind of uh, help with the interpretation here. But you see the challenger kind of does three things that are different from the average salesperson. They teach the customer something new. They tailor the message, and they are assertive. They take control of the customer conversation. Let me click on each of those in a little bit more detail. First, teaching. The challenger is the seller who shows up with the new idea, often an idea the customer themselves hasn't even thought of before. Rather than asking the customer what's keeping you up at night, as so many salespeople do, and as we know from our research, customers can't stand, the challenger sees it as their job to show the customer what should be keeping them up at night. They show up with that new idea to save money, to make money, to avoid risk, to grab market share. Often, again, the idea the customer hadn't considered before as a possibility. And remember, before, earlier, we said that's the thing in today's world of information empowerment where customers learn, learn on their own what they want is the thing that they missed, the thing that they couldn't learn. And that's exactly what challengers are out there selling. They're selling that new idea. Number two, they take that message. Today's a world of consensus selling. We all know that in sales, especially complex sales. And challengers are able to take an idea and make it resonate with all the different stakeholders who have to weigh in on the decision. They can make it resonate with IT, with marketing, with procurement, with finance, with legal, all the people up and down the food chain, the decision makers, and also the technical users. And lastly, they're assertive. Now, this is the one we get the most confusion about. I think when people hear the word challenger, they think of a sort of aggressive or obnoxious salesperson. That's not what we're talking about at all. Otherwise, we'd have called these people jerks and not challengers. What we're talking about is an appropriate a professional, empathetic um, manner of holding your ground. It's holding your ground around the new idea you brought to the table. It's holding your ground around terms and condition and pricing and not caving instantly. Um, and there are lots of ways that you see this manifest. It manifests around getting levels of access. It manifests in the RFP process. It manifests around the negotiation table. It manifests when it comes to talking about this insight you've just put on the table the customer hasn't thought of before and they say, hey, wait, that doesn't apply to us. You know, what's your reaction as a salesperson? What we find is challengers are very good at holding their ground in a professional, 
a, a polite, a courteous, and an empathetic kind of way, but they don't back down easily. They hold their ground. Now, compare that with the relationship builder. The relationship builder is about getting along with people, being likable, being generous with their time, all great stuff. But if you were to sum it up, really what makes a relationship builder tick is their desire to reduce tension wherever it crops up in the customer dynamic, in the customer conversation. The challenger, though, is able to use tension to their advantage to get the customer to blink, to get them to scratch their head, to rethink things. And here's why that matters. And just as an aside, before I move off this page, a, a little known fact and something that's often overlooked here is that um, you know, relationships uh, still matter in the world of sales. In fact, challengers are the second best relationship builders amongst the five profiles. But what it tells you, though, what the data tells you is that challengers take it the next step. They use the relationship as a means to an end, not an end unto itself. Their view is that the relationship is necessary to get in with the customer, to get into, invited into their office, to sit down with them, to get their mind share. But what earns the business and what earns their loyalty long term is your ability to push their thinking, to bring the new ideas to the table. So in their view, relationships matter, but the currency of the relationship in a world where customers are on their own has actually changed a good deal. And what does, that, what does that mean? Why is it so important to build tension? Well, if we put the data by complexity and we look at simple product sales on the left against complex solution sales on the right, what you see is high performers, and that's what we're looking at here, high performers in a product selling world on the left against high performers in a solution selling world on the right. High performers in a product selling world, the best approach in that world is really be a hard worker because it's all about volume. You know, it's, it's uh, business deals in or, or opportunities in equal business out on the back end. It's sales is a machine in that world. But in a world where you're going in, you're selling uh, a solution, where you're selling something disruptive for the customer, well, the customer's reaction is, Look, change is hard. I'm, I'm not sure I'm on board for that. The status quo seems okay. And that's your competitor today is, is really the customer's uh, uh, willingness to kind of uh, abdicate to the status quo. And so the challenger is able to create that tension to show why the pain of same is actually worse than the pain of change. It seems hard. It is hard. But doing what you're doing right now is much, much worse than the, the change journey we're going to have to go on together. And that's why they really dominate in a world of complex solution sales because solution sales are nothing more really than a sale of disruption. You're selling behavior change, and that's why challengers do so well is by creating that tension necessary. And that's why you see them at 54% of high performers in a solution selling environment. Now, as I said earlier in the last 10 minutes here, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the organizational capability required to enable challenger sellers, because I think there's a real danger in looking at the challenger as merely a, a case of getting individuals to be able to challenge customer thinking. But the reality is if you go out as a challenger and you try to take control and you try to push the customer's thinking and you've got nothing to push their thinking about, well, you're not a challenger. You're actually just annoying in that level, at that case. Uh, in that case, so really it's the job of the company, and in most companies the job of marketing, to come up with messages that they can put in the hands of challenger salespeople to go out and push the customer's thinking. Now, when we look at the companies who do this best, what we find is that challenger messages have four things in common. Challenger collateral has four things in common. The first thing is that a challenger message leads to what makes your company unique. It doesn't lead with what makes your company unique. Pull out your sales pitch deck right now and flip through the first four pages. And what I'm willing to guess is that those pages are some combination of your mission and values, a brag sheet of your biggest customers, a map of the world to show you know, how global you are, and all the things that we think are important. And then the rest of your pitch deck is all about your new XP1000 solution that, and all the features and benefits and how it outperforms the competition. Now, that's all well and good, but the difference in a challenger conversation is all that stuff that makes you unique comes at the end, not at the beginning of the conversation. What we're trying to do in a challenger conversation is tell a story about the customer, tell a story about the customer's world that leads to the thing that makes us unique. Now, getting this right requires asking a really tough question, which is, what makes you unique? What is the reason that your customer should buy from you instead of your competitors? That's a big and that's a really tough question uh, to answer. But once you identify that thing, once you crystallize it, and truthfully, it's not the generic stuff. It's not that you're entrepreneurial. It's not that you're innovative. It's not that you're customer-centric because so are your competitors. And if you don't think they are, you're probably not giving them very much credit or enough credit than they deserve. It's got to be the thing that you can do and your competition can't. And then you've got to be able to tell a story that leads to those things, not with those things. Second, it's got to challenge the customer's uh, assumptions. We've got to be able to come in and make the customer blink, as I said before. We've got to give them something to chew on that actually um, really gets them to rethink some core assumptions around their business. It really gets us, them to see things in a very different light. Um, it can't be the kind of thing that a customer just sort of agrees to willy-nilly. Um, it's got to be the kind of thing that the customer says, 
hold on a second, I'm not sure I'd buy it. You're going to have to prove it or back it up with data, and we're going to get there in a moment. But it's the kind of thing that, that causes some skepticism or provokes the customer a bit and gets them to lean in intellectually in the conversation. Number three, it's got to catalyze action. Uh, you've got to be able to show the customer why the pain of same is worse than the pain of change. Uh, there's a company we really admire, uh, ADP, who uh, uh, coined the term. They, they use a specific tool to help the customer catalyze action. They call it a rope calculator. We love this term. Rope stands for the return on pain eliminated. They don't use ROI calculators um, at ADP because an ROI calculator is just the return on buying your stuff. A rope calculator is supplier agnostic. It's designed to show the customer why they must catalyze action, why they've got to do things now. And again, it is supplier agnostic. It's not about you and it's not about your stuff. It's about solving a problem that you just taught the customer was out there. Number four, it's got to scale across key customer segments. We're not talking about a 1,000 insights for a 1,000 different customers. We're talking about a handful of insights that map to your key customer segments that got, have to evolve with time. And again, this is why it's the job of the company. It's typically marketing to figure out what are those messages that map to our key customer segments and then equip salespeople to go deliver them. Now, when you put it all together, you get something that looks a little bit like this. We call this the choreography of a challenger conversation. Um, now, when you, look, when you look at this, you find that um, the different stages of a challenger conversation, they ebb and flow in terms of the level of or the type of emotional engagement for the customer. You see negative emotional engagement at the bottom to neutral to positive at the top. And we might, what we're trying to do in the challenger conversation is really actually cause the customer to rethink their business, take them to a dark place, and then show them the light. That's the path that we're trying to create here. The first thing you'll notice is a challenger conversation doesn't start with a question, nor does it start with an exposition about your values and your history as a company and your map of the world. It starts with a warmer. Now, the warmer is a way to actually demonstrate credibility, to show that you understand the customer's world. Say, hey, look, you know, um, let's say I'm an IT salesperson. You know, we meet with CIOs all the time, and CIOs are worried about issues like cloud computing. About, they're worried about things like uh, security. They're worried about things like uh, bring your own device to work and mobile and all these kinds of things and how they impact uh, IT infrastructure and security and application development, all these big issues, does that sound about right? It's designed to make the conversation feel very different from the get-go uh, because so many conversations that we know that, that customers have to endure with salespeople sound exactly the same. So it's designed to kind of get the customer to breathe a sigh of relief that, wow, this, this person has done their homework. That, those are the issues I really care about. That's kind of the stuff that's keeping me up at night. But there's an important pivot point that comes next. So we call this the reframe moment. This is where the, you put the big idea on the table. You put the idea that the customer hasn't thought of before. Well, you kind of agreed to the stuff in the warmer. Here's the thing we're betting you haven't thought of before. It's the thing that we see only our most progressive customers really thinking about. It's the new idea for, save, for saving money, for making money, for avoiding risk, for engaging your employees, for stealing market share from your competitors that you haven't actually thought of before. And typically, if done well, this is the moment where the customer reacts skeptically. They push back. They say, whoa, I've never heard that before. It's not really how I think about my business or my market. You're going to have to back that up with data. You're going to have to prove it. Um, and so that's what we got to do next. The third box here is rational drowning, a fancy uh, term for backing it up with objective, third-party, unbiased data, showing the customer why logically what you just claimed, that big idea you put on the table, is actually factually correct, that you can actually back it up with numbers and data. But as we know in B2B, just like in B2C, and if not more so, customers will um, actually buy an emotion. They just use reason and logic and data to justify their decision. And so we've got to really dial up the emotional component of the sale. We've got to show the customer why this really matters to them. And this is where tailoring that critical challenger skill really comes to play. Uh, comes into play. You've got to be able to show the customer why this idea matters to you as the head of IT, why it matters to you as the head of IT security, why it matters to you as a database administrator much farther down the line. But all these people, all of their opinions matter when it comes time to deciding on a supplier to go with. And so you've got to tailor that message. You've got to make it matter emotionally for that individual. Here's why it makes things better for you personally. It's box number five where we talk about the new way forward. This is where the salesperson says, look, wouldn't it be great if there were a way to solve that problem that I just taught you was out there, that I just backed up with data, that you were skeptical about, but we backed it up with data, I showed you why it's actually true, that I made tie to you personally at an emotional level. Wouldn't it be great if there were some way to solve that? And if you've done your homework, ideally at this point, the customer says, yeah, that would be great, but who could actually do that? Who could solve for that problem for me? And then it's box number six where you talk about you, where you talk about your company, where you talk about your values, where you talk about your solution and what makes it unique and why you are the only supplier who can actually solve for that opportunity. You're the only supplier, coincidentally, who can actually solve for that problem that you just taught the customer was out there. So if you're going to build one of these, obviously the first place you start is box number six. What makes you unique? What is the thing that is unique 
that is credible, that is defensible, that is valuable about our, uh, about our company and our value proposition, our solution set, that I need to start with, the thing that only we can do and nobody else can. And then I've got to go to the reframe. I've got to ask myself, if that's true, why aren't customers lined up around the block ready to pay us for this capability? What if it were true about their business, if the customer's business, if this were true, what would get them to want to pay for that unique capability that we provide? What must be true for them to want to pay for that? And once you string that together, once you identify those two nodes, the rest of it really falls into place um, uh, very, um, uh, very easily. Now, I, I want to be clear, though, this is a lot of hard work. And, and in our organization, we've been doing a lot of work with sales organizations trying to um, recruit, uh, train, um, equip sales uh, managers to be able to coach to the right challenger behaviors, to be able to, as a leader, create the right climate to not just drive this change amongst your sellers, but to allow people to engage in challenger selling behaviors. But we've also been doing a lot of work with marketing to try to figure out, you know, what is it that makes us unique? Uh, what is it about the customer's business that they, sh they don't know but should know, that if they did know, they would actually really value about our solution, our unique capability? And how do we build a story that we can put in the hands of the average seller that they could actually go out and tell? Um, so these are the kind of components of what it means to be a challenge organization. And in about 30 minutes, I'll admit, so I love the format. It's fast, but, you know, really, I'm guessing for a lot of listeners, it probably raised as many questions as, uh, as we resolve today. So um, I can be reached um, uh, many different ways, as, and my, uh, my colleague uh, here at CEB, uh, lots of uh, content and tools able for down, uh, available for download at thechallengersale.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, CEB underscore Challenger, or the LinkedIn discussion group, uh, the Challenger Sale LinkedIn discussion group. We've got about 6,000 participants on there actively engaged in a dialogue, both sales and marketing, about how do we build a Challenger commercial organization, what's hard about it, what are the lessons learned, um, so much more than I've gotten into in today's 30 minutes. But I want to thank um, uh, the, uh, you guys for, uh, for listening today. Thank you for your time and look forward to hearing from you in the future.